Give him one more round of applause. All right, judges, you know what you should be doing. Court says you are on deck. Our first storyteller of the night. Where is he at? There he is. Okay. Is like a chef. He serves up sci-fi with a healthy mix of dark humor. All the way from Cleveland, please welcome Marcus Calvert. for this evening is called My Other Self. Marla Torres pulled a fully stocked cleaning cart in front of room 702 where she stopped. She slid the white mag card through the door's reader and opened it. In her 40s, a Latina was short and plump with a plain, born looking face. Powder blue gloves covered her callous hands. Her black hair was long and curly. Her housekeeping uniform was a bell shaped pink. She pulled a bundle of white towels from the top of the cart and carried them in both hands. After a surreptitious glance toward both ends of the hallway, Marla stepped inside. The suite was more of a title than reality. Room 702 came with a living room, bedroom, kitchen nook, and a full bathroom. The curtains and blinds were closed, drowning the room in shadows. The man's voice could be heard arguing as if he was on a cell phone. She noticed a half-empty pizza box and a four-pack of beers on the coffee table. The TV was on, going into breaking news about how the police were no closer to catching the haiku killer. <laughs> Marla stepped through the darkened room. She found a man's suitcase on the bed. Inside were neatly folded clothes and assorted toiletries. The bathroom door was closed. She moved up to it with the stealth of a prowling cat. I'm telling you I can't do this anymore, the man shouted. I just want my life back. Well, that's too bad, came the reply. Also in the man's voice. Hmm. Marla frowned as she realized he was talking to himself. That should have upset her, seeing as he was the haiku killer. With a cleansing breath, Marla slipped her right hand between two towels. As her fingers wrapped around the gun, she allowed the towels to fall to the floor. The suppressor cap Ruger was untraceable and loaded with hollow point slugs. Housekeeping, she called out with a faint Mexican lilt. The bathroom door opened inward. Her gun hand rose to chest level. What the hell are you? The murderer started to say before Marla shot him twice in the sternum. <laughs> Unable to stand or scream, the haiku killer merely fell to the bathroom title. His real name was Randolph Sims. At 46, the divorced father, too, was an unemployed buyer for an out-of-business auto parts company. He had a slim bill, thinning blonde hair, and a gold watch on his left hand. His blood-covered pink shirt and brown dress slacks had been neatly pressed. As he gawked up at her with his frightened, angular face, <laughs> Randolph tried to beg. Marla responded with two more silent shots to, into his face, which still him forever. With a free hand, she pulled out a cheap little cell phone with a camera feature. She took two snapshots of the deceased. <laughs> <laughs> then she sent them to a disposal email address. Her account would be fattened within an hour of verification. The parents of Randolph's fourth victim used to belong to a faraway cartel. They called in some very old favors, or it was passed down, and Marla was flown in to rectify the situation. A freelance hitter, she obtained a copy of the case files and managed to track Randolph down inside of a week. He was in the middle of his ninth kill when Marla found him. She watched him hack his victim, a small boy, to death, and then carve a haiku on his back with a scalpel. Yes. Then she followed him to the hotel and planned her little visit. She looked for signs of police and or federal surveillance. The last thing she needed was to get interrupted by a SWAT team. Surprisingly, no one else had tracked the careless killer down yet. She turned to leave. A pair of bloody hands grabbed her by the back of her collar and dragged her toward the sink. A sharp Marla dropped the phone, hugged herself with her right gun hand, and fired past her left hip. A pair of waist-level shots, shots to start. The third one went higher. That's when Marla's attacker let go. She spun around, backed away, aimed her ruger with both hands. What she saw didn't make sense. Marla Torres was a rational woman. 
While she was raised Catholic, she only went to church when it was work-related. This sight before her didn't make her believe in heaven. It made her believe in the other place. The reflection of Randolph Sims slumped out of the mirror from the stomach down. Even with two bullets in the head and two in the chest, it glared at her as it fought to breathe. Its blood poured into the sink. Marla glanced from a tape of glared to the real Randolph Sims. The dead one. The one who lifelessly gazed up at her. The reflection gas. One last time. Two, four, finally. Die. Marla picked up the camera, took some more shots of the room. But these she didn't send. These were just for her. Marla took off her uniform. Not a need for her street clothes. She dragged the cart into the room and stuffed her uniform and gun into a black garbage bag. Then she carried the bag out with her. No one had seen her leave. Relieved. Marley headed into an elevator and punched the button for the ground floor. Adrenaline was subsiding. Her breathing slowed. She looked up and realized that the elevator car was lined with reflective metal. Oh, God, Marley exclaimed, surrounded by reflections of herself. The killer's eyes widened as she tore open the bag and pulled out the rooter. In her panic, she kept turning around, ready to shoot. But the reflections looked normal. They looked normal. The elevator reached the lobby. Door slid open, and a relieved Marla Torres was shot twice in the head by her own reflection, which is waiting for her in a wall sized mirror across from her elevator car. Thank you.